live from Boston, Massachusetts, it's theCUBE, covering IFS World Conference 2019. Brought to you by IFS. Welcome back to Boston, everybody. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. This is day one of the IFS World Conference. I'm Dave Vellante with my co-host, Paul Gillen. Melissa DiDonato is here. She's the CEO of SUSE, and John Roscoe is the CEO of Acumatica. Folks, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you so much. So you guys had the power panel today talking about digital did. transformation. I got a question for, for both of you. What's the difference between a business and a digital business? Melissa, I'll give you first crack. If you're a regular old business and a digital business, yeah. everyone's digital these days, aren't they? I mean, when we think about, um, I, was, I was interviewing the, one of the leaders in Expedia, and I said, are you a travel company or are you a digital company? Like, wh where do you lead with? Um, and she said to me, no, no, we're a travel company, but we use digital. So it seems like the more and more we think about what the future means, how we service our customers, customers being at the core, everyone's a digital business. The way you service, the way you communicate, the way you support. Um, so whether you're a business or non, you're always going to be a digital you business. You better be a digital business. And you better so, be a digital business. So, okay, John, I, I take a so, slightly different so, tact on that, which is we talk about digital and analog businesses. And analog businesses are ones that are Data, data silos, they have a lot of systems, so they think they're digital, but they're disconnected. And you know, part of a transformation is connecting all the systems together and getting them to work, work like one. And I think the, the other common thread is data, right? A digital business maybe puts data at the core and that's how they get competitive advantage, but I want to ask you guys about your respective businesses. So Suse, obviously, you compete with the big whale, Red Hat, you know, the big news last year, IBM, $34 billion. How did that, or will that, in your view, affect your business. It's already affecting our business. We've seen a big, big uptick in interest in Susan and what we're doing. You know, they say that um, a big part of the install base customers that Red Hat and IBM currently have are unhappy about the decision to be acquired by IBM, whether they're in conflict because we're a very big, heavily channel business, right? So a lot of the channel partners are not quite happy about having one of their closest competitors now be you know, part of the inner circle, if you will. And other customers are just not happy. I mean, Red Hat had fast innovation, fast pace, and thought leadership, and now all of a sudden they're going to be buried inside of a large conglomerate, and they're not happy about that. So when we look at what's been happening for us, particularly since March, we became independent company, now we're the world's largest independent open source company in the world, since IBM has been taken over from, from Red Hat. And, um, you know, big, big uptick. Since March we became independent, we've been getting a lot of questioning, where are we, where are we going, what are we doing, and, and hey, I, you know, I haven't heard about Susan in a while, what are you doing now? So it's been really good news for us, really, yeah, really good news. I, I mean, you know, we're huge fans of Red Hat, we do a lot of their events, and... and I'm a huge but, fan myself. But, but I tell you, I mean, we know from firsthand, IBM has this nasty habit of buying companies, tripling the price. Now they say they're going to leave Red Hat alone, we'll see. And then, yeah, like they said they yeah. leave Lotus alone and, uh, yeah. and all the others. SPSS, uh, you saw that, Ustream, you know, we are one of our platforms. What's your view, Do you how do you think it's going to go? I think it's a, it's I, don't a think it's it, I, I don't think it's about cloud, I think it's about services. And I think that's the piece that we don't really have great visibility on. Can IBM kind of jam OpenShift into its customers you know, businesses without them even really knowing it. And that's the, that's the near-term cash flow play that they're trying to, you know, Yeah, affect. but it's not working for them, is it though? Because when you look at the install base, 90% of their business sits within the Linux open source environment and OpenShift is a tag along. I don't, I don't know if that's a real enabler for the future rather than, you know, an afterthought from the past. Well, well wanna, for 34 billion, it better be. I want to ask you <laughs> about, the, about the cost of, of shifting because historically, you know, if you were IBM, you were stuck with IBM forever. Uh, what, what is involved in customers moving from Red Hat to SUSE? Presumably you're doing some of those migrations now. We are, we're doing them more and more. In fact, we're even offering migration services ourselves um, in some applications. It depends on the application How layer. simple is that? It depends on the application. So we've got some telco companies with very, very complex, 24 by seven, you know, high paced, big fat enterprise applications around billing, mm -hmm. for example. They're harder to move. Code. A lot of custom code, yep. really deep, really rich, they need you know, constant operation because it's billing, right? Big, fat transactions. Those are a little bit more complex than say the other applications are. Nonetheless, there is a migration path, and in fact, we're one of the only open source companies in the world that provide support for not just SUSE, but actually for Red Hat. So if you're a Red Hat 4 or RHEL customer that want to get off an unsupported version of Red Hat, you can come over to SUSE, we'll not just support your Red Hat system, but actually come up with a migration plan to get you into a supported version of SUSE. If it's a package, set of apps and you don't have to freeze the code, it's actually not that bad. It's to, not to that migrate. bad, no. All right, John, I got to ask you, so help us understand Acumatica and, and IFS and the relationship, you're like sister companies, yeah. you're both ERP 
providers. How do you work together or? Yeah, so we're both owned by a private equity firm called EQT. Yep. And EQT, um, uh, IFS is generally focused on $500 million and above companies, so more enterprise, and we're focused on core mid-market. So say 20 million to 500 million. And uh, so very complementary in that way. Uh, IFS is largely direct selling. Um, we're 100% through channels. Uh, IFS is stronger in Europe, we're stronger in North America. And so they see these as very complementary um, assets. And rather than do perhaps what's going on with the IBM Red Hat discussion here, slam these big things together and screw them up, um, they're trying to actually keep us independent. Uh, so they put us in a, in a holding company, but we're trying to leverage as much of, of each other's goodness as we can. But is, and so, is well, there a migration path? I mean, for customers who, who reach the top end of your, of your market, can they smoothly get to IFS? Yeah, it's not going to be like a smooth, you know, turn a switch and, and go, but it absolutely is a migration option for customers, and we do have a set of customers that are outgrowing us, you know. We have a number of customers now, over a billion dollars running on Acumatica, and, um, you know, for a company, we've got one that we're actually talking to about this right now, operating in 41 countries, global, they need 24 by 7 support. We're, we're not the right com the company to be running their ERP system. On your panel today, you guys are talking about, a lot about digital transformations, kind of lessons learned. What are the big mistakes you see companies making and kind of what's your roadmap for success? I think um, doing too much too fast. Mm -hmm. Everyone talks about the digital innovation, digital transformation. It's really a business transformation with digital being the underpinning, the, the, the push forward that carries the business forward, right? And I think that we make too many mistakes with regards to doing too much, too fast, too soon. That's one. Um, doing and adopting technology for technology's sake. Mm. Oh, it's ML, it's AI, and everyone loves these big buzzwords, right? All the code words for what technology is. So they tend to bring it on, but they don't really know the outcome. Really, really important. At Sousa, we're absolutely obsessed with our customers. And during a digital transformation, if you remain absolutely sick of anything about your customer at the core of every decision you make and everything you do, particularly with regards to digital transformation, you want to make sure that business outcome is focused on them. Having a clear roadmap with milestones along the journey is really important, and ensuring it's really collaborative. We talked this morning about um, digital natives. Um, you know, we're all young, aren't we? <laughs> Me in particular. Um, but uh, you know, we, I, I think the younger uh, generation of digital natives think a little bit differently perhaps than we were originally thinking when we were their age. And I, you know, I depend on that thinking, I depend on that integration of that thought leadership infused into companies to help really reach customers in different ways. Our customers are buying differently. Our customers have different expectations. They have different deliverables they require and they expect to be supported a different way. And that, that those digital natives, that young talent can really aid in that mm -hmm. delivery of really of good thought leadership for our businesses. So John, we're seeing IT spending at the macro slow down a little bit, you know, a lot of different factors going on. It's not a disaster, it's not falling off the cliff, but definitely pre-2018 levels. And mm -hmm. one of the theories is that you, you had this kind of spray and pray Kind of what Melissa was saying, going too fast, trying everything, uh -huh. um, and now we're seeing more of a narrow focus on things that are going to give a return. Do you see that happening out there? Yeah, definitely some, I mean, uh, people are looking for returns even in what's been a really vibrant economy, but yeah, I agree with Melissa's point, there's a lot of uh, ready, shoot, aim uh, projects out there, and you know, the biggest thing I see is the ones that aren't, that fail, that aren't, the ones that aren't led by the, the leadership. They're sort of given off to some side team, often the IT team, and said, go lead digital transformation of the company. And digital transformation, you know, Melissa said this morning, it's business transformation. You've got you've to bring the business part of it to the table, and you've got to think about, it, that's got to be led by the CEO or uh, the entire senior leadership team has to be on board. And if not, it's not going to be successful. So pragmatism would say, okay, do, get some quick hits, get, get some wins, and then you got, Kind of the you know Bezos, Michael Dell mindset: go big or go home. So, what's your philosophy? Moonshots or you know quick hits? Well, I, I always think starting you know you've got to understand your team's capabilities. So, starting is something that you can get a gauge of that. You know, particularly if you're new and you're walking into an organization. You know, uh, you know, Melissa, I don't know how long you've been in your role now. 65 days. Right, so there you go. So it's probably a good person to, to ask what, you know, what <laughs> you're finding out there. But I think you know, getting a gauge of what your resources are. I mean, one of the things you see around here is there are you know, dozens of partner firms that are, can, can be brought in to you know, um, supplement the resources you have in your own team. So being thoughtful in that is part of the approach. 
Uh, and then having a roadmap for what you're trying to do. Like we talked this morning about a customer that uh, Linda had been talking about, had been working on for six or seven years, right? And you're saying for an enterprise, a very large enterprise company, taking six or seven years to turn the battleship maybe isn't that long. Okay, so you're, you got the sister company going on. Do you have a commercial relationship with, with IFS, or are you just here as kind of an outside speaker and I mean, thought I'm, leader? I'm here as, a, as an outside speaker thought leader. There is talk that perhaps we can you know, work together in the future. We're trying to work that out right now. Oh, okay. I want to ask you about open source business models. We still see companies sort of struggling to come up with not profitable, but you know, insanely profitable business models based <laughs> on open source software. What do you see coming out of all this? Is there a model that you think is going to work in the long term? I think the future is open source for sure. And this is coming from a person who spent 25 years in proprietary software, having worked for the large ERP CRM vendors. 100% of my life has been dedicated to proprietary software. So whilst that's true, I came at SUSE and the open source environment in a very different way as a customer, running my proprietary applications on open source Linux-based systems. So I get I come with a little bit different of a, a you know of an approach, I would say. Um, the future's open source for sure. The way that we collaborate, the innovation, um, the borderless means of which we deliver, you know, it, thought leadership within our business is much, much different than proprietary software. You would think as well that you know, the, the, the wall that we hide behind in open source, being able to access software anywhere in a community and be able to provide thought leadership, um, masks and hides who the developers and engineers are and it instead exacerbates the thought leadership that comes out of them. So it provides for a naturally inclusive and diverse environment, which leads to really good business results. We all know the importance of diversity and inclusion. I think there is definitely a place for open source in the world. It's a matter of providing it in such a way that creates business value, that does enable and foster that growth of the community because nothing, nothing is better than having two or three or four or five million developers hacking away at my software to deliver biz better business value to my customers. The commercial side is going to be around the support, right? The enterprise customers are going to know that when bump goes in the night, I've got someone that I can pay to support my systems. And that's really what SUSE is about, protecting our install base, ensuring that we get them live all of the time, every day, and keep them running frictionlessly across their IT department. Now, now there's another model, the so-called open core model, that holds that the future is actually proprietary on top of an open base. Are you saying that, that you don't think that's a, a good model? I don't know, I, I, jury's out. If you, next time that you come to our event, which is going to be in March in Dublin, we're doing our SUSECON conference, leave that question for me and I'll have an answer for you. you I'm pontificating. Well, I did. And it's, it's a date, but, but, but I'll the 12th of March. It's certainly, it's certainly working for, for Amazon. I mean, you know, Amazon's criticized for bogarting open source, and, but Redshift is built on open source. I think Aurora is built on open yeah. source. They're obviously making a lot of money. Well, they have your, your open core model, model failed for Cloudera. Hortonworks was pure. Hortonworks had a model like you, know, you guys and Red Hat, and that didn't work. And now that was kind of profitless prosperity of Hadoop, and maybe that was a, sort of an overhand. I, I, you know, I think our, right, I think our model, I mean, the future's open source, yeah. no question. It's just what level of open source within the stack do we keep proprietary or not, as the case may be, right? Do we allow open source from the bottom to the top, or do we put some proprietary components on top to preserve and protect, like an umbrella, the core of which is open source? I don't know. Um, we're thinking about that right now. We're trying to think what our future looks like, what the model should look like in the future for the industry. How can we service our customers best? At the end of the day, it's satisfying customer needs and solving business problems. And if that's going to be pure open source or open source with a little bit of proprietary to service the customer best, that's what we're all going to be after, aren't so we? So there's no question that the innovation model is open source. I mean, I don't yeah. think that's a, that's a debate. The hard part is, okay, how do you make money? What about open source for you guys? I mean, are you using open source technologies? Yeah. Presumably you are, everybody is, but. So we're, we're, we're very open APIs. We joined three years ago, we joined openapi.org, and so we've been one of the, the leading ERP um, companies in the industry on publishing open APIs. And then uh, we do a lot of customization work with our community, and all of that's going on in GitHub. And so it's, it's all open source, it's all out there for people who want it. Not everybody wants to be messing around in the core of a transaction engine, and that's where you get into you know, sort of the, 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 the core argument of you know, which pieces should be people modifying. Do you want people in the kernel? Um, maybe, maybe not. Um, and you know, this is not my area of expertise, so I'll defer to, I'll defer well, to Melissa on it. I, I but, think to your but, point, yeah, you know, having, people, having people be able to extend things in an open source model, having people be able to find a library of customizations and components that can extend Acumatica, that, that's obviously a good thing. I mean, I think you hit on it with developers. I mean, that to me is the key lever. I mean, if I were VMware, I'd hire you know, 1,000, 2,000 open source software developers and say, go build 
next generation 100%. apps and tools and give it away, and yeah. then I'd say, okay, Michael Dell, make your hardware run better on the software. This yeah. that's a business model. You make a lot of hundred percent, and we're you know we're going to be very acquisitive right now. Mm -hmm. We're looking for our future, right? We're looking to make a mark right now, and and where do we go next? How can we help predict the outcome and next step in the marketplace when it pertains to you know the the, the core of applications and the delivery mechanism in which we want to offer the ease of being able to get thousands of mainframe customers with complex enterprise applications, let's say for example to the cloud. And a part of that is going to be the developer network. I mean, that's a really, really big, important mm. segment for us. And we're looking at companies, who can we acquire, what's the business outcome, and what do the developer networks look like? So cloud and edge have got to be two huge opportunities huge. for you, right? They and are huge. Again, it's all about developers. I think that's the right strategy at the edge. You see a lot of edge activity where you, some, somebody trying to throw a box at the edge with a top-down, you know, traditional IT model. It's really the, the devs up that I think are going to It is, it is the, the devs up, so you're exactly right, yeah. exactly right. Yeah, I mean, Edge is fascinating. What's, it, that's going to be amazing what happens here in the next 10 years, and we don't even know, but uh, we, we ship a construction edition. We've got a, a customer that we're working with that's instrumenting all of uh, their construction machinery on something like a thousand construction sites and feeding the sensor data into Acumatica. And so it's a way to tr keep track of all the machines and what's going on with them. You know, obviously shipping logistics, um, the opportunity to start putting things like you know, RFID tags on, on everything and instrument all of that out at the edge. And, and then the issue is, is you get this huge amount of data and how do you process that and get the intelligence out of it and make the right decisions. Well, well how do you? How, how do you how, and data's plentiful, insights you know, aren't is the sort of Yeah, well, I think, I think that's where the machine learning breakthroughs are going to happen. I mean, we're, we're, we've built out a team in the last three years on machine learning. Um, uh, all the guys we've been talking about, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, are all putting out um, uh, machine learning engines that companies can pick up and start building models around. And uh, so we're doing ones around you know, inventory, logistics, shipping. Uh, we just released one on expense reports. Um, so it's, it's going to be, uh, you know, that really is where the, the uh, innovation is happening okay, right now. So you're not an inventor of AI, you're going to take those technologies, apply them to your business. And yeah, we don't want to be the engine builder, we want to be the guys that are building the models and putting the insight for the industry on top. That's our, our job. All right, Melissa, we'll give you the final word on uh, IFS World 2019. I think, is this your first one? It's my first one, yeah. yeah. Thoughts, I'm, I'm, I'm quite, uh, what's the I'm, bumper sticker say when your trucks are pulling away here? Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. The bumper sticker would say, when you think about the future of open source, think about SUSE. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, I'd, say, right. I'd say on the event, I mean, I'm super impressed. I think it's, uh, the, the group that's here is great. The customers are really enthused and you know, I have zero bias, so I'm just giving you my perspective. Yeah, so. I mean, the, the ecosystem is robust here. I yeah. have to say, I think they said 400 partners and, I was pleasantly surprised when I was walking around last night. This is night. your second one, isn't it? Well, you sell entirely for second one, my first. Right? Oh, you're yeah. first. Yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah. well so, done. And so what do you think? Event similarly like I said, coming yeah. back? Yeah, yeah. good I, energy. I would love to yeah. come back, you know, especially overseas. I know you guys do a bunch of stuff overseas. There you go, he so. wants to travel. Dublin so. in March. March we the 12th. Do. Dublin's a good place for shows. Are you doing it at the, the big conference the, yep, center there? Yeah, the big conference center. That is a, and, that and is a great and venue. And not just because the green thing, but it's actually <laughs> Green and Guinness. <laughs> that, that no, that's a really color? nice venue. It's I modern, know. it's got, I, don't know, I think, three or four floors. It so does, yeah, good. yeah, we're looking forward to it. And then evening events at the, you know, the Guinness storehouse. So there you go. Exactly fantastic. right, good. so we'll look forward to hosting you good there. Stuff. All right, great, see you there. We'll come with our tough questions Deal. for you. <laughs> all right, all right. thanks you guys. All right, really guys, appreciate your time. Thanks, thanks very, very much. much. All right, and thank you for watching. We're right back, right after this short break. You're watching theCUBE from IFS World in Boston. Right back.